everyone. This is the recording for the 2.06 lesson in American Empire. Okay, we're getting to some exciting times in U.S. history. Of course, they're all exciting. Some just might be a little more exciting than others because of all the exciting, turbulent things going on. Okay, let's start the intro here. After a century of avoiding European or Asian affairs, the United States abandoned isolationism and began to flex its new economic and military muscles. Desire for resources, markets, and bases led to the acquisition of territories beyond the continent and expanded an ongoing debate over colonialism in a nation founded for freedom. Through purchase, annexation, force, treaty, and war, the United States grew to include the territories of Alaska, Hawaii, Puerto Rico, and the Philippines. Interest in other parts of the world led to military and diplomatic actions as well. But what should the U.S. role in the world be? What status do the new territories have? Did the Constitution follow the flag? Goals for this lesson. Explain the U.S. policy of isolationism during most of the 19th century. Summarize the arguments for and against American imperialism. And recognize the causes, events, and results of a Spanish-American war. Remember to go to Lesson Resources, grab your reading guide and or lesson answer key. And let's begin. Let's look what we have to do today. Read pages 606 through 616, the reading guide, a virtual field trip, and a checkpoint, and continue to work on your project. That is important. Don't forget to neglect a little bit of time, or don't forget, don't neglect to devote a little time to your project every day. That's what I was trying to say. So let's go to page 606. And we can see page 606 is the beginning of a new chapter, 27 American Imperialism. And there's a timeline. And what do we see in these pictures? Does this look like a time of peace? No, it looks like a time of turbulence, maybe a time of war. So that right there can give you alone a hint of what this unit might com be comprised of. Some turbulence, some war, some fighting, some problems there. Okay, let's start the reading then. American imperialism. In the quarter century following the Civil War, most Americans had relatively little interest in the world beyond their borders. Instead, they directed their energies towards settling the West and building a new industrial economy. While European powers like Britain and France sent their soldiers to conquer lands around the globe, the United States had an army smaller than that of the European state of Bulgaria. In the 1890s, however, the nation's focus began to shift outward. Faced with a slumping economy, businessmen looked abroad for new buyers for American products. Political leaders, fearing that European countries were growing too strong, proclaimed that America should set up its own outposts overseas. During the next two decades, the United States would fight its first foreign war since the Mexican conflict of the 1840s and acquire overseas territories stretching from the Caribbean to Eastern Asia. A nation born in anti-colonial revolution became a colonial power. Early foreign policy, isolationism. America's foreign policy, its plan for political, economic, and social interactions with other countries, has changed over time. The nation's first president, George Washington, Washington urged isolationism. That is, the belief that America should stand apart, stay out of foreign wars, and avoid excessive political or economic involvement in foreign affairs. That, if you remember from first semester, that was part of his farewell address. When he was leaving the presidency, ready to hand over the reins to the next president, John Adams, he gave a farewell address where he um, urged America to be isolationist. In 1796, as Washington prepared to leave office after two terms, he urged his countrymen to remain detached and distant from the quarrels of European nations. Five years later, President Thomas Jefferson echoed him calling for peace, commerce, and honest friendship with all nations, entangling alliances with none. These statements reflected a widely held belief that the young United States should remain aloof from foreign conflicts whenever possible. For most of the 19th century, the U.S. government avoided political and military engagements, with some exceptions. In 1823, after various Spanish colonies in Central and South America gained their independence, President James Monroe proclaimed a new American foreign policy known as the Monroe Doctrine. The president declared, the American continents are henceforth not to be considered as subjects for future colonization by any European powers. According to the Monroe Doctrine, the United States would resist any European attempts to set up new colonies in the Americas or to interfere with Latin American affairs. 
At the time, the United States did not have the military strength to back up its bold words. Still, Monroe's statement had the long-term implications in suggesting that Europe and the Americas were two separate spheres and the United States should take the leading role in the Western Hemisphere. In 1846, a glaring exception to the isolationist direction of America in foreign policy, the United States went to war with Mexico. From this war, the United States gained vast new territories and become, became the states of New Mexico, Arizona, California, and part of Texas. Some prominent Americans, including Congressman Abraham Lincoln and the writer Henry David Thoreau, protested the war as a violation of the nation's principles. But most Americans saw the conquest of the Southwest as a necessary part of the country's manifest destiny to stretch from the Atlantic to the Pacific. Arguments for imperialism. Let's look at this cartoon here quick on the side. In this 1885 cartoon, imperialistic Germany, Great Britain, and Russia grab what they can of Africa and Asia. So you see these other countries in Europe um, taking what they can, being colonial, colonialist, colonial empires and taking over the, the countries that were prime for the picking. Arguments for imperialism. As a young nation, America mostly maintained an isolationist foreign policy, seeking to stand apart from foreign wars and entangling alliances. But by the late 19th century, with the growth of new technologies and a new sense of power, many voices began to urge the nation toward imperialism, the practice of extending the nation's power by taking over other lands or exercising political and economic control over them. One frontier closed on to another. Throughout most of the 19th century, Americans pushed westward into the frontier, the land still open to settlement, though the settlement usually meant displacing the native inhabitants. In 1890, the U.S. Census announced that the American West was so heavily settled that in effect the frontier was closed. In his influential 1893 essay, The Significance of the Frontier in American History, the historian Frederick Jackson Turner argued the frontier had molded a ruggedly individualistic, distinctively democratic American character, and it kept Americans from developing the kind of deep political and social inequities that prevailed in Europe. Werner worried that with no more frontier to energize and motivate them, Americans might lose their, their drive and energy. Although Turner never suggested as much, many people began to believe that the United States should seek out a new frontier beyond the country's borders. Seeking new markets. Beyond Turner's abstract theories about the influence, influence of the frontier on character, the closing of the frontier had concrete consequences. It meant the United States would have to look elsewhere for new supplies of the raw materials that fuel the nation's growing industries. At about the same time as the closing of the frontier, an economic depression that began in 1893 led to an oversupply of manufactured goods that Americans could not sell at home. Needing both raw materials and new markets for their goods, American businessmen looked abroad. But there they saw the European empires of Britain, France, and Germany gobbling up vast parts of Africa and Asia, monopolizing resources and blocking access to new markets. These businessmen argued the United States could enjoy continued prosperity by only joining, joining in the imperial competition. Many political and military leaders agreed. Oh, let's stop here for a minute. Let's look at the side note. In economic terms, a market is a place to sell goods. When other countries import American-made products, they become markets for U.S. exports. Just wanted to clarify that term there. Many political and military leaders agreed. Whether they will or no, declared Alfred Thayer Mahan a, naval, Mahan, a naval officer, Americans must begin to look outward. In 1890, Mahan published a highly influential book, The Influence of Sea Power Upon History, 1660 to 18. 1783, in which he argued that to be a world power, a nation must build a great navy. In order to secure markets for its goods, Mahan said, America must build up its fleet and support it with naval bases around the world. One of the most enthusiastic fans of Mahan's book was a young Theodore Roosevelt. Social Darwinism and Imperialism A new imperial role for the United States also seemed justified by the popular ideas of social Darwinists who claimed their unchecked economic competition would ensue, ensure the survival of the fittest. Those who urged American imperialism had little doubt the United States was the fittest of all nations. From the social Darwinist perspective, international economic competition would lead to the strongest civilization to swallow up the weakest, which could only benefit an imperialist America. 
as one senator proclaimed, God has made us adept in government, that we may administer government among savage and st senile peoples. He has marked the American people as his chosen nation to lead the regeneration of the world. So you can see, we're get, that's not everybody, but some people believe in that philosophy. Annexing Hawaii. In 1867, Secretary of State William Henry Seward orchestrated the purchase of Alaska from Russia for $7.2 million. At the time, many people scorned the purchase of Seward's folly. Americans in the 1860s were not yet ready for the idea of possessing land so far from their borders. By the 1890s, however, American expansionists showed special interest in a far-off cluster of islands in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, Hawaii. For American merchants trading with China, the island served as an essential way station. Furthermore, Americans had been living in Hawaii since the early 19th century when Protestant missionaries arrived hoping to convert the people to Christianity. The coming of missionaries and other settlers provided proved devastating to the native Hawaiians. Newcomers brought diseases to which the Hawaiians lacked immunity. By the early 19th century, more than half the native population had perished which is similar to when Columbus and other European explorers came to the United States and decimated the Native American population. The settlers prospered by growing sugar and exporting it to the United States and Europe. By 1892, more than two-thirds of the land in Hawaii was owned by Americans and European planters. In 1887, the planters pressured Hawaiian king to let the United States set up a naval base at Pearl Harbor on the island of Oahu. In theory, Hawaii still maintained its independence. In practice, it was rapidly becoming a colony of the United States. In 1891, a new ruler, Queen, and this is hard, it's hard to say, Lili Kulani, ascended to the Hawaiian throne. A determined nationalist, Lili Kulani, I hope I'm saying that somewhat right, it's one of those historical mysteries, uh, resolved to resist American influence. In 1893, she proclaimed a new constitution reasserting Hawaiian, Hawaii's sovereignty. And here's a picture of the Queen there. American businessmen, many of whom were descendants of missionaries, called to the United States government for assistance. American Marines stormed ashore and advanced on the Queen's Palace, is what I think it says in the next page. Yes, palace with cannons and machine guns. To avoid bloodshed, the Queen agreed to resign. Watching the American flag raised over her palace, Lili Kulani lamented, My dear flag, the Hawaiian flag, that a strange flag should rule over it. May heaven look down on these missionaries and punish them for their sins. Hawaii's independence had come to an end. The United States formally annexed the islands in 1898, and in 1900, Congress established the territory of Hawaii. And here's this map. Let's look at this. American territorial expansion from 1857 to 1917. Um, the purple is acquired by purchase or treaty. So we have Alaska. Panama Canal zone over here. Um, seeing what else we have in purple. That's all I can tell from at first glance. Next, acquired by acquired by war or occupation, we have the Philippines, Guam, Wake Island, Johnson Atoll, Hawaii, Midway Islands, Jarvis Baker, American Samoa, um, Puerto Rico, Virgin Islands. Uh, that's all there, labeled in that color. All right, continuing on. The Spanish-American War, a splendid little war, as it was called by Teddy Roosevelt. In the late 1890s and early 1900s, the United States acquired several new territories in the Western Hemisphere in the course of a wide-ranging war with Spain. The Spanish-American War firmly established an American colonial presence in the Caribbean and in Central America and brought the United States strategic holdings in the Pacific. Okay, how much farther do I have before I run out of my 15 minutes? I think I'm going to stop here because I don't believe I'll finish the next section before the time runs out on this first time. So we'll stop here. Part two of the recording will begin with Cuba, Remember the Maine.